my life to you, I give shout from the inside out. Welcome to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Moulter of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today. Sit tight, get your Bible, and get ready to get in the Word with us as we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book through the Word of God. So Deuteronomy chapter 21, title of our study is Death and Life. Last week we took a look at... Um, what would happen if you were out chopping wood in the forest and the axe head accidentally flew off and how they were to deal with those kind of situations. And I was told afterwards last week, I made maybe too many puns about uh, an axe to grind or flying off the handle. So I've decided to bury the axe. So just letting you know. Um, but as we move into this chapter, it kind of does lead into the next section because there's a section of an unsolved murder. And, uh, and these crimes, you know, we would call them today maybe a cold case. And so we'll take a look at that. Uh, there are some challenging subjects in this chapter, just to make you aware of. Um, and we'll see there's two cases where God warns the people not to have cold hearts. One towards women prisoners of war, the other towards uh, other children in the family, whether it be the middle child or the baby of the family, that they would not be excluded from the inheritance. Um, and then we'll conclude with the uh, two examples of dealing with cold hearts, one of rebellious kids and how they used to deal with that in the Old Testament. So kids, if you're in here, pay attention. Listen to your mom and dad. Don't rebel. And, uh, and then we'll see uh, criminals. And it was more than giving them a cold shoulder. It was publicly humiliating them. And we'll take a look at that as well. But my hope is from today's study, we'll see that it's through Jesus that we can be declared innocent for our crimes. And that as prodigals, we can return to our Father. And uh, my hope is also that we'll see that Jesus uh, is, is the cure for the curse that man brought upon this world. And that, in fact, Jesus took that upon himself on the cross for us. And so my hope is that we'll see that he came to rescue us as we take a look at some of these uh, challenging subjects uh, in this chapter. So with that, let's take a look at verse 1 through 9. And we'll take a look at what the... Israelites were to do with these unsolved murder cases. Picking up here in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 1. If anyone is found slain, lying in the field, in the land which the Lord your God has given you to possess, and it is not known who killed him, then your elders and your judges shall go out and measure the distance from the slain man to the surrounding cities. It shall be that the elders... Uh, of the city nearest to the slain men will take a heifer which has not been worked, which has not been pulled with a yoke. And the elders of that city shall bring the heifer down to the valley flowing with water, which is uh, neither plowed nor sown. And they shall break the heifer's neck there in the valley. Then the priests, the sons of Levi, shall come near, for the Lord your God has chosen them to minister to him and to bless in the name of the Lord. By the word, every controversy and every assault shall be settled. And the elders of the city nearest to the slain men shall wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley. Then they shall answer and say, Our hands have not shed this blood, nor have our eyes seen it. Provide atonement, O Lord, for your people Israel, whom you have redeemed. And do not lay innocent blood to the charge of your people Israel. And atonement shall be provided on their behalf for the blood. So you shall put away the guilt of the innocent blood from among you when you do what is right in the sight of the Lord. We'll pause there. Now we see here this circumstance. If you are out wandering in a field or out for a nature hike or out tending your field as a farmer and you're out there and you notice there's body in the field and you go over and investigate and you see that it's a dead person. You don't know the circumstances of the death. You're just lying there in the field. You were to tell the, the city elders and they were to contact the other city elders and then they were to kind of measure, if you will, which cities he's closest to. And um, 
and they were trying to figure out, did anyone see what happened? Does anyone know what happened? Um, and we see that they were to sacrifice this heifer or this cow, um, and they reached a swear they didn't know how the person died. So the cities would then be cleared from this person who had been slain from that body that was left in the field. So it was kind of this cold case, right, this unsolved mystery, this unsolved crime, and we assume the elders and the city judges came and they investigated thoroughly um, before they took steps outlined here, and they were trying to figure out what happened. Um, it kind of reminded me a little bit, I don't know about you, but I enjoyed reading or watching good detective um, stories and movies and books, how they solve their case, whether it's doctors or lawyers or, or uh, police detectives, just kind of find those things intriguing. Um, but we see here that uh, they were to uh, look into this, the circumstance, and if they couldn't solve it, then they were to uh, declare that they were innocent from any knowledge of what happened. But you need to know at the same time, this didn't mean that the unknown guilty party or murderer um, was automatically forgiven. Uh, rather, the Lord was to cleanse the land. He wanted to forgive Israel of the crime that had been committed. So God's justice was upheld. His law was obeyed, even though the culprit was unknown and, and unapprehended at that time. Right? Um, uh, Warren Wiersbe said this ritual points us to Jesus Christ and his atoning work on the cross. And we see that from the elders' words. Do not lay innocent blood to the charge of your people, Israel. It reminds us that when Jesus was before Pontius Pilate and before Israel, as he was uh, going to be led away to be crucified, on that tragic day, Israel asked to have her Messiah crucified. Pilate washed his hands, and he said, I'm innocent of this man's blood. And sadly, the people replied, let his blood be on us and on our children. It says that in Matthew chapter 27. So we see this picture of this innocent heifer, and it points us to Jesus Christ, right? Now, Jesus died for the nation, even prayed from the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And so Jesus fulfilled God's will. He upheld his holy law, and God withheld judgment from Israel for approximately 40 years after that point, and then the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Uh, but Jesus died for the sins of the world. He died so he could gather us together as his beloved church. And he died for Israel, right? He died for his people. Um, and he, he desires that they would be rescued, that they'd have their eyes open, or it says in uh, the New Testament, that the veil would be lifted, that they would see that Jesus is the Messiah, and they would put their faith and their trust in him. So we see that Israel had this regulation, what to do if they had this uh, cold case, this unsolved situation. Next, we'll take a look here at verse uh, 10 through verse 14, and uh, take a look at uh, female captives or prisoners of war, and what they were to do in that situation. So picking up here in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 10. When you go out to war against your enemies, and the Lord your God delivers them into your hand, and you take them captive, and you see among the captives a beautiful woman, and desire her, and take her for your, your wife, then you shall bring her to your, your house, your home to your house, and she shall shave her head and trim her nails. She shall put off the clothing of her captivity, remain in your house and mourn for her father and her mother a full month. After that, you may go unto her and be your husband, and she shall be your wife. And it shall be that if you have no del delight in her, then you shall set her free. But you certainly shall not sell her for money. You shall not treat her brutally because you, humili you humbled her. Now we see that uh, in this section that it talks about slavery and, and captives and, and prisoners of war. And, um, and that was common at that time. In fact, it, it's throughout human history, there's been slavery. And we dealt with this uh, in context in Numbers 31. So if you want a more in-depth study, you can even go back to the recording we did in Numbers 31. Um, but the fact was that as the men went out and they uh, were looking and, and there was a gal who was unmarried, because we see she's mourning for her father and her mother, there's no husband in the situation, that they were um, most likely going to be taking that gal 
into the home that she had to mourn for a month, and, uh, and then they could be uh, married. But we see at the same time here that uh, these, these women, uh, they couldn't be sold as slaves, right? And that was very common at the time. In fact, it, it's, it's tragic when you take a look at human history, how women have been treated throughout the ages. It isn't until Christ came that he really set um, women more free from the captivity that they had, where they would begin to treat as equals and, and treated with respect. And in fact, you even see that with, with uh, Jesus and, and uh, the disciples that he had and, and the women that were there, and even at the resurrection, they were, the gals were the first ones uh, that were able to go and share the good news. And, and so we see that, uh, that things are very different in, in the New Testament. In fact, the gospel even takes it a step further as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He, he said um, that even if you looked upon a woman uh, to lust after her, you've committed uh, that, uh, that adultery in the heart, or you've, you've committed that sin in the heart. So God's desire has always been purity. His, his desire has always been holiness. And in fact, Jesus even said that um, from the beginning, right, that God's design for marriage was one man and one woman. And that was, that was his design. Uh, God created marriage for that, that purpose. Um, so the gospel reminds us of that, that that's God's design. Um, but we see that these men, as they went out, um, they had to be cautious, right? They were allowed a certain liberty, but they were not to abuse that liberty. Uh, and again, we see that um, in Numbers 31, it talks more through that. So if you want to look at that, you can. Um, but as I was thinking about this, it just reminded me that, um, you know, whether it would be uh, that desire in the battlefield or whatever, uh, we have to safeguard our hearts against things that the world would say is permissible. At that time, if you were in battle, uh, anything went, right? You could do whatever you want as you took over a town. And God put limits on that. He, he tried to protect people because he knew the hardness of the heart. In fact, we see that even later as the uh, religious leaders begin to try and question Jesus, you know, and they would ask, well, if God's design is one man and one woman, why did, why did he permit a divorce? And Jesus said, well, it was actually through Moses that that took place because of the hardness of man's heart. That's not God's design. That's not his desire. But what man's heart is so corrupt and so evil uh, that God wanted a way to allow the woman to escape that abusement, to escape that terrible situation. So he allowed that because he knew that man's heart is totally deprived. And so we see that there's a, there's a certain protection that God sets up here for even those that would be taken captive in war. Well, next we'll move on to uh, dealing with the, the, the rights of the children, and we'll take a look at the firstborn and how that would also play into the other children in the family. And we'll see that here in verse 15 through verse 17. He says, this is Moses speaking again. He says, if a man has two wives, one loved and the other unloved, and they have borne him children, both the loved and the unloved, if the firstborn son is of her who is unloved, then it shall be on the day that he bequeaths his possessions to his sons, that he must not bestow the firstborn status on the son he loved of the wife in preference of the son of the unloved, the true firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the unloved wife as the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he has, for he is the beginning of his strength, the right of his firstborn. We'll pause there. Now again, as I just mentioned, God's design from the beginning was one man, one woman for marriage, right? Adam and Eve, um, did we, but we see that some of the patriarchs and others in the Old Testament didn't always follow that. And uh, it's unfortunate because they got in a lot of trouble. And you've heard me say this before. If you take a look at David's house and kind of the collapse of it later on with Solomon. And um, I mean, Solomon was one of the wisest men that you see in scriptures. And yet uh, his heart was turned by his many wives into idolatry and um, but we do see at the very tail end of his life, he gives his children uh, some final wisdom that they should fear God and obey the commandments and walk in a way that pleases the Lord. 
So we see that that's not good God's desire, that's not his plan. There are cults that try and use that, such as Mormons or LDS, that say, well, look, it's in the Bible, therefore it's permissible. And if you head to that direction, there's a lot of things in the scripture. <laughs> it's history. It doesn't mean it's for us to practice, right? It's there as, as a warning, right? That, hey, look, people are messy, right? They're, they're human, they fall, they're sinful. We don't need to repeat their mistakes. It's, it's recorded there for us to learn from. So we see that there's these situations where there'd be multiple children, and, uh, and God established that the firstborn were to be set aside. They were to be special. As Israel was leaving uh, Egypt, and they began their Exodus journey, one of the plagues was the Passover, where God spared the firstborn child, right? The firstborn son, and and they were sheltered, and it was through the blood of the lamb that was applied to the doorposts. And so in honor of that gracious miracle, God commanded the firstborn of Israel, uh, the man and the beast should be dedicated to him from that point going forward. So in essence, Israel was God's firstborn son and uh, belonged to him. And so it was ordained the firstborn son of the family would inherit this double portion of the estate. They were to look after the rest of the family they were to take care of, of those family members and use the resources wisely. But we see if there were two sons, the elder son would then kind of receive uh, two-thirds, the younger would receive that one-third, so the oldest would get the double portion. Um, Pastor Chuck Smith had an interesting point in this. He said, in salvation's history, it should be noted that God occasionally bypassed the firstborn son and chose the secondborn son. Abraham's firstborn son was Ishmael, but God chose Isaac. And if we take a look at, at Isaac and the children he had, Esau and Jacob, right? Esau was the firstborn, but God chose Jacob, his secondborn, that the blessings would come through him. And then later on we see Jacob, and he had um, uh, 12 uh, sons, and we know that Joseph and Benjamin were his, his favorites, and uh, which again, we've talked about, if you have multiple kids, uh, don't tell them which one's your favorite. That doesn't help. Just, you're all my favorites, right? Um, but we see that um, Jacob would give a special blessing to Joseph's second son, Ephraim, not to Manasseh, the firstborn son. So we see, we de we, we see these certain circumstances where God would kind of bypass that, and that would be the secondborn son that the blessing would come through. And uh, it reminds us that God doesn't accept our first birth of the flesh, right? We need that, that second birth, the spiritual birth. And, uh, and uh, then he makes us really his firstborn children. So we need that spiritual birth. We need that, that born again experience, right? And, and Jesus in John chapter three has this conversation with Nicodemus, one of the Jewish leaders of the time, one of the rabbis, and he begins to talk about that the need to be born again. And Nicodemus is confused, and how do I go back into my mom's? What? what are you talking about born again? He's like, you're the teacher of Israel, and you don't know this? And so he begins to explain that he needs this spiritual birth. Right? He needs to have this relationship with the Father. And his, his intriguingness in this begins to move him closer uh, to the gospel message. And so when we surrender our life to Jesus and we give our life to him as Savior and Lord, we become born again. God's spirit comes and takes residence within us. Right? We're, we're born from above, you could say. God has is, is, got a hold of our heart. He begins to change and transform us from that point on. And, uh, and the reality is we're then adopted into the family of God. And there's this beautiful picture uh, of what Christ has done for us, uh, that then he bestows his blessings upon us, which we're totally unworthy of, right? Uh, but he, he does that because he loves us. And so we see that this, these, these firstborn son rights point us to the, the blessings we have in Jesus Christ, that it's through Christ that we have redemption, we have forgiveness, and we have the blessings uh, as we're adopted in his family. Well, next in verse 18 through 21, we'll take a look at what they did at that time when they had rebellious children, and um, hopefully we'll take heed 
if uh, you're younger and you've got parents. Um, so picking up here in uh, verse 18, it says, If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and who, when they have chastened him, will not heed them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of his city, to the gate of his city. And they shall say to the elder of the city, The son of ours is stubborn, rebellious, he will not obey our voice, he's a glutton, he's a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So you shall put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Now, it's interesting that this would take place in the Old Testament. As some have said, this is a little bit severe. But I think it would only happen once before everyone else would catch on. Right? If you heard what happened to Jimmy next door and how he was rebellious against mom and dad, and all of a sudden they took Jimmy out and they stoned him to death, like, okay, I'm going to shape up, but I'm going to listen to mom and dad. I don't want that to happen to me. Right? So it began to have this this desire where people begin to really honor their mom and their dad. And unfortunately, we see a breakdown of that throughout the scriptures, but then also we see that in society, uh, that there's just this breakdown of the family unit and uh, this breakdown of, of respect for those uh, above you. In fact, we see a lot of that in the culture today, a, a disregard for mom and dad, right? And uh, And I'm sure we all went through that phase as teenagers that we know more, right, than mom and dad did. But it's even been pushed further than that today. Uh, And we see that in the the schools that they're trying to teach the kids that your parents don't know what they're talking about and and that we have the correct information to give you and this kind of indoctrination. And so we see that this uh, rebellious spirit continues on today. And so at that time, if you were stubborn, rebellious, and you were a kid, and you'd get into some serious trouble. And we see if the parents uh, had that situation, they did everything they could to correct that child, but the kid was still disrespectful and hurtful, uh, then they would take him out to the, the city gates, and the elders would investigate, and eventually they'd storm him to death. Now, in Luke chapter 15, we get this picture of uh, the prodigal son, and you could say, This could be the first original prodigal son, except he didn't leave home. He stayed at home, and he squandered what things he had, and he was disrespectful um, and dishonored his parents. And and that stems from the fifth commandment, that we're to honor our father and our mother. It's actually the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with us, live a long life in the land we live in. Now, if you're younger and your parents are still alive, and, or even you're living at home, heed the voice of your parents. They know a little bit more than you know, right? They've been around this sun and the orbit of the planet, and they've been on uh, this earth a little bit longer. They're going to have some more advice and some more wisdom. doesn't mean that everything they're going to say is 100% biblical, but overall, you can glean the advice from them, right? They're going to have counsel and input uh, that can help you, and Uh, and help you live a longer life, right, as you heed some of the advice uh, that they offer. So we see that this child disobeyed his parents, dishonored his parents, and then in essence disgraced the community. And day after day, this child would resist the pleas and the warnings and the chastening of his parents. The parents are trying to correct the child in the way that he should go. The child's obstinate, refusing. Uh, We see even refusing to work. So not contributing to the home, not contributing to the community, um, really just being a d- disgraceful to the family uh, as they're not doing anything. And then this prodigal would get angry, uh, let up some steam against their parents, and uh, we see that this child was in need of repentance, right? And needing to realize that the sin and the harm that they were causing to their family, to their parents, and oftentimes when people get in that state of stubbornness and rebellion and obstinacy, uh, it's due to selfishness in the heart. They're consumed with focusing on self. They're not looking at the bigger picture. They're not caring about their siblings or about their parents. All they're caring about is self. So God has to do that work in the heart. God has to show them their, 
their need to surrender their life to him and repent of that sin. So we see the parents were to take the rebellious child to uh, the local council at the gates, bear witness that they were rebellion, they were defiance, and then we see the council would, would make that decision, um, which I gotta imagine would be very difficult. That parents would even wanna go through that process. So this was like the extreme case, right? This is like, I don't know what else to do, but my child's gonna end up in jail, they're gonna end up on the, on the streets, you know, doing stuff they shouldn't be doing. This is like the last ditch effort where it's like, okay, they need to repent. And if this doesn't awaken them up, then I don't know what else is gonna do. So we see the hope was that the child would change their ways. If the boy refused, then the only verdict what we see here was death by stoning. And so we see the men of the community would participate in that, um, which is interesting because when you do take a look at Luke chapter 15, there's this picture of this prodigal that goes and squanders away all that his father had given him and that was going to be his as part of the inheritance. And there comes a point where he comes to his senses. It's interesting because in Luke 15, right before that, there's this parable of uh, the, the lost sheep. And we see that it says, when one sinner repents, that in heaven uh, there's angels rejoicing. And then you see this, this parable of the, this gal who lost a coin and most likely one of her bridesmaid coins that they would have in the, kind of their headdress. And she finds it and tells her friends and, and it says there's, there's rejoicing in heaven when one repents. But you don't see the word repentance in the story of the prodigal. And I think that's because you actually see it lived out. You see it demonstrated that this young person came into their, their senses, as it says, as they were feeding the, the, the pigs and began to desire the food that the pigs were eating, which again, if you were Jewish, being around kids is to, uh, around pigs is totally unkosher, so that was kind of a thing he wasn't supposed to be doing to begin with, but we see that he came to his senses, and he begins to say to himself, I don't even deserve to return home as, as a son. I'm just gonna go as a hired servant, and I'm gonna say, Father, forgive me. I've sinned against you. Um, Please hire me on as a servant. And what we're told in that, that story is that the father, straining, saw his son afar off and ran to meet him. And what's interesting because it connects with what happened here is that this, this son who was um, stubborn, uh, we see that uh, if the elders were in the city gates and they saw this boy approach, they might have been tempted to refuse to let him in. Or maybe in their anger, maybe they would have picked up stones to stone him to death. But we see the father was running to the boy and he held the boy in his arms, he kissed him and hugged him. And the reality is the elders could do nothing. Right? And if the elders were, were set on um, throwing stones, they would have hit the father. And so we get this picture in terms as well as uh, of what happened at Calvary, where God took the punishment that we deserve that he might be able to welcome us home, right? Jesus left heaven to take the punishment that we justly deserve because our hearts are rebellious. But he rose from the dead and he's welcomed us into the family of God. And so Jesus came from heaven to rescue us and he, he sheltered us by what he did on the cross to protect us from the wrath that we deserve, the judgment that we deserve for our rebellion against him. And it's through Christ that we have forgiveness. It's through what he's done for us that we have salvation. And uh, if you take a look at Luke 15, not only that, but then he throws a big party, rejoicing. Uh, this one who was dead is, is alive. This one who was lost is now found. And we see that this welcoming that takes place. So God had set this up, um, and we see that this points us to what Christ has done for us as well. Well, we'll take a look at these last couple of verses and uh, what they were to do with criminals, and we'll see that here in verse 22 and verse 23. He says, if a man has committed a sin deserving of death, and he's put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on a tree, but you shall surely bury him that day. 
so that you do not defile the land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. Now this is a rather gruesome act that they did to humiliate criminals. Uh, and we see that God says that the people who did this, these capital crimes that they committed as they were hanging on this, these trees, um, they were uh, accursed. Um, and this becomes interesting to us because we see that anyone who was cursed, uh, that was hung on a tree was cursed. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, it says, Cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. And uh, he's referring back to this particular verse here in Deuteronomy. It's interesting because this points us to what Christ has done for us, that Christ became that curse for us when he hung on Calvary's cross for you and for me. So when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, he broke that fellowship with God. He began the rebellion of mankind. And, and there was a threefold consequences of that that directly related. We see that through Adam that man would have to toil and do hard work by the sweat of his brow, that no longer attending things out of the ground would be easy, but it would be difficult. That man would have to labor to provide for his family and it would be difficult to work. We see the woman was... Uh, to then endure uh, hard child labor. And then we see the earth was cursed. There would be thorns and weeds and thistles uh, because of this broken fellowship with God, because of man's rebellion, man's sin. And so we see that this curse entered the world. Now, we fast forward to when Christ came and the Romans uh, made a crown that they put on Jesus. What kind of crown did they make? A crown of thorns, right? And what we see is we see this picture that Christ took uh, the curse of those thorns upon himself. But not only that, he died on a tree. He took that curse upon himself as well. And so we see that he's taking the curse of mankind upon himself, the punishment for sin that we deserve, he took voluntarily upon himself. And so we see that he came to bear the curse against our sin. He hung on a tree to redeem us from the curse. So those that trust in Christ can no longer be condemned because Christ took that for us. And so Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law and satisfied it. So when Christ hung on that tree, he hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. The wrongdoing that, that uh, we've sinned against him, all of our sins. And it, it killed him. It, I mean, he, he died, he was buried. But three days later, he rose from the grave. He defeated death, and he conquered the grave. And it's through Christ that we can have forgiveness that we can be set free from the curse that man brought into the world. So in closing, we see that it's through Jesus we can be declared innocent for our crimes. And as prodigals, we can return to our Father because Jesus took the curse of man upon himself to come and to rescue us. The gospel or the good news changes our position in heaven from a courtroom to an adoption ceremony. We're welcome into the family of God. And when we take a look at God's kingdom, it endures forever and forever. If you've read the end of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, you see that nothing can stop God's kingdom. He's, he's saving people. He's changing lives, transforming families. So our response should be that of thankfulness to God for his mercy and his grace towards us. And we should be concerned about God's kingdom more than man's and a desire to want to see more people come to know him, to be rescued as we've been rescued as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you as we've taken a look at this challenging chapter together and these different subjects and themes here, Lord, that we see that it points us to you as all of scripture does. Lord, that you love us and that Jesus, you took the, the curse, you've took the wrath the judgment that we rightly deserve for our sin, our rebelling against you.
and that Jesus, you, you died. You were laid in that tomb. But three days later, you rose from the grave. You overcame death. And you came to rescue us. Not only to forgive us of our sins, but allow us to enter into a relationship with you. To become your children, your sons and your daughters. Because of your love. We ask God that you'd help us just to continue to grow in this relationship with you. To have a deeper heart of appreciation and thankfulness for what you've done for us, Jesus. And that there would, through that sacrifice, Lord, would encourage us and motivate us to want to live a life completely devoted and surrendered to you. We ask God that you'd help us to, to find all that we need in our relationship with you and not in the things of this world. And Lord, we pray if there'd be anyone here today, this morning with us in person or watching online, whether through the live stream or listening to this audio later on, who need to surrender their life to you, we ask God that today would be that day of salvation. We ask, Father, that you would convict them of their sin, their rebellion, and show them your amazing grace, your desire to forgive and adopt. And so, Jesus, we ask if there be any here who are ready to make that decision to surrender their life over to you, to trust in you, we ask, God, that you would move on their heart today to do that. And if you're here this morning as every Christian is praying, you need to say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me. I need to get right with God. I need to have my sins forgiven. I need to have that right relationship with God. And I see it's through Christ that I can be forgiven. It's through Christ that I can have mercy and grace, be declared innocent, and be welcomed into heaven as a child of God. If that's you this morning, you're ready to make the decision, I simply want to lead you in a prayer. I encourage you to truly mean this in your heart and repeat these words after me. God, I realize that I'm a sinner and that my sin separates me from you. God, I believe that you love me, that you sent your one and only son on a rescue mission, and that Jesus, you died on the cross for my sins, and that you were buried and rose from the grave. God, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins, I surrender myself to you. Help me from this day forward to follow you. And put your spirit within me that I may do your will. God, I thank you for loving me. Jesus, I thank you for forgiving me. I thank you for being my savior my Lord and my friend. I pray this prayer in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Look, if that was you and that was the first time you prayed to receive Christ or perhaps rededication, let me know. I'd love to encourage you, pray with you, give you some resources, give you a Bible if you don't have one. You've been listening to From the Inside Out with Pastor Tim Molter of Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls in Minnesota. We're glad you could join us today as we study God's Word, cover to cover, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Would you like to partner with us? Consider becoming a giver with us to support this ministry. Please visit ccfergusfalls.com giving. Find out more about this ministry and all of our ministries. Check out ccfergusfalls.com. May God bless you as you study His Word with us and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Shout from the inside out.